And welcome back to another episode of Pokemon Knowledge. You know what they say, it's never a dull day in the old Pokemon hobby, and today is no difference. Uh, there's been some crazy developments that happened, some crazy news that was recently dropped today. PSA has now acquired the eBay Vault. Uh, eBay acquired Golden Auctions. We're going to get into all this, but before we get into the actual topic of this conversation... As you guys can see on the screen right now, we have a very special guest, Mr. Dan Catchem All Collectibles, one of my favorite people in the hobby. Always a good conversation. But uh, before we get into the meat and bones of the conversation, Dan, how's everything going? How you been, bud? It's going well. Uh, people will notice my voice is not 100%, a little bit under the weather. I sound as if I went to Houston Collecticon, because this is my normal voice the week after a Collecticon. But unfortunately, I, I did not go just a little bit under the weather, but... uh. Business is doing well. Obviously, today, big news dropped, and, and things are going to fundamentally change uh, yet again. Yeah. <clears throat> Were you, was this even, like, remotely on your radar as a possibility, or did this kind of block? Well, before we get into it, I guess we should probably explain to the people out there who might not even be aware of what we're talking about. So, uh, earlier today, around 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, so uh, PSA sent out an email to everybody saying that PSA has acquired the eBay vault. And so pretty much what happened is PSA acquired the eBay vault and then PSA collectors sold golden auctions to eBay. So if you, it depends on how you look at it. Like maybe this is more complementary to PSA's business model where maybe golden auctions while it might appear to be complimentary is way more complimentary to eBay's business model and dealing with graded cards and, you know, more vault services probably is more complimentary to the PSA. But the more important news on it and why we really care is one prices for eBay vault are going to change and they're going to change quick. And then number two, now when you submit cards to PSA, PSA always had its own vault, but now the cards that go from the PSA that you submit the PSA that go into the PSA vault, there's going to be a very, very easy streamlined process to take those cards right from the PSA vault and then list them on eBay. So what that could mean potentially on like the low end, because right now eBay vault is cards with a minimum value of $250. But if mm. you submit a ton of cards to PSA, put them into the vault, but then still have that vault service potentially for lower dollar amount cards, it's going to change this hobby as we know it, just like in a fundamental flipping sort of way. Did I, did I cover everything there, Dan? Yeah. Yeah. And um, I, I guess you started asking if I saw it coming or if I was like blindsided by it. So the way eBay vault exists today, 0% selling fees. Like I, I've actually pivoted a decent portion of my business focused on capitalizing uh, on that. I, I do consignments for one to 4%, not really too relevant moving ahead. Um, uh, the, the people who have cards in going to continue business as usual, as long as we're allowed to. And then once it, it goes, nice thing they said, there will be like a grace period before the transition where they'll allow people who have cards in there to withdraw them for free. So they're not even going to charge you shipping to get them back, which is great. But uh. 0% selling fees are going away. Obviously, 0% selling fees were like too good to be true. Yeah. But uh, what loomed on the horizon, supposedly, uh, whether they ever plan to do that or not, we'll, we'll never know. But 3% buyer's premium is what was stated. And, and what we're getting now with PSA acquiring it, it's anywhere between 7 and 16%, I believe, if I'm re remembering correctly. Yeah, 7% so... for anything above five grand, <clears throat> and then... 16% for anything less than 200 which you know if you, when you factor in obviously like if you have an eBay store you're paying less fees if you have any kind of contracted rates you're paying less fees but for average Joe Smo just has an eBay account you know you are already paying 13 and a half percent so now to jump up to 16 but then not to have to worry about shipping not have to worry about potential insurance not have to worry about storage of cards but more importantly, and the thing that, you know, this is most important for is it works in two ways. It, it's in the buyer's interest and it's in the seller's interest because as the buyer, you don't have to worry about the seller scamming you and you getting an envelope in the mail with a piece of cardboard. But yeah. then as the seller, 
at the same time, you don't have to worry about you actually sending the card to a person. They receive it, and then they say, item's not as described. Item was never shipped. You know, all the nuances that could happen with, like, potentially trying to scan the seller. Like, you eliminate all that stuff. So that's great. I mean, and... Yeah, it, it, as far as, like, silver linings go, eBay Vault was 250 and up. So like sub 250, you, you have a really reasonable option. I mean, to pay three or four more percent to have all the storage, all the fulfillment taken off your plate, like that's that's very reasonable. But but me, like what I was focusing on was more the higher end and yeah. um, e eBay, like eBay proper, as, as long as you have a store, I don't think it works without a store, but 12% up to 2,500. And then I believe it's like three or 4% thereafter. So... Unlike super high end stuff, like I actually sold Zach Gem Mint Pokemon. I sold his PSA ten base first Charizard last year in the eBay vault for two hundred and seventeen thousand five hundred dollars, zero eBay fees whatsoever. Through this new deal, the, the whole PSA vault thing, that would have been over ten thousand dollars to sell. Um, obviously a very drastic difference. And on eBay today, like eBay today removed from the eBay vault, removed from the PSA vault, it would be. 12% on 2500 so it would be $300 plus it would be about 3% on the uh, on the additional so it would be like 6500 or or 7000 so it it will actually be cheaper in 6 months or a year from now 6 weeks i, I have no idea when this happens but it'll be cheaper to just sell directly on eBay for like yeah. the very high end for anything yeah. above like 15 20000 <clears throat> yeah but even at Yes, but even at that point, like, again, it, it goes back to you don't have to take any of that risk. So yep. there might be somebody out there who is like, I might just pay the six grand or whatever it's going to cost because when eBay or eBay Vault, I call it PSA Vault, whatever you, they end up with the name, when that Vault service sends out that first edition Charizard, that's it. You're clear, you know. It's already been well, through authenticity. You're if somebody gets that card and they say it was lost in the mail, it was damaged, it's a fake slab or any of the shit people try to pull, you you get your money. Like, And one thing to add on that, though, like, and, and this is a question that I literally just thought of now. I'm assuming authenticity guarantee will still exist in the state that it does today. I, I'm not entirely sure on that, but as of today, I think it's $150 or maybe it's $250. Any, any raw or graded cards individual cards that are sold obviously if they're in the in the if they're in the vault already they undergo authenticity to go into the vault mm -hmm. but if i sell on my ebay a two hundred thousand dollar card not through the vault that goes to the middleman that goes to i mean psa acts as the middleman for that yeah. will that still exist on ebay i presume so but I, i'm not 100 percent sure if that will be the same thing i would assume it does exist now this is where it gets tricky. That's why you have to have like dollar amounts because you have to make it worth it their time to authenticate or, you know, a card. But now mm -hmm. if you're sending cards directly from PSA, they're grading your cards and then sending it to the vault, they get to bypass that authenticity step because they've already done that step by grading your cards, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe that's where PSA is even going to get more of an advantage because you may only be able to send lower dollar amount cards through the vault through PSA submissions. You know, we, d we don't yep. know how this is going to roll out at the beginning, but that makes more sense that that will be the early initial releases. Sorry, even if you have a PSA slab that hasn't been, you know, submitted recently, maybe you can't do it. It'll be interesting. So I've already like told you, but I'll let everybody else out there know too. So, I reached out to Nat Turner first thing this morning. <laughs> We're me and Nat Turner the same way as me and Mr. Dan Catch 'em All Collectibles are doing emergency live. Me and Nat Turner were also doing emergency live too. So he's already he's already given the okay and I'm just working with Nat's uh administrative assistant working out a scheduled time to have him on the channel. So to my knowledge, I'm gonna be the first channel that Nat speaks publicly on about the uh, PSA acquire in the eBay vault. So that's pretty cool. I mean, do you have a tentative date time or you're not going to tease any of that yet? Uh, not going to get into that yet. Just we're going to wait a little bit, but we're just kind of yep. working out of time right now, but I already got the, in the most traditional, got the approval. Way, just like, yeah, cool. But, yeah. Looking forward to that. The last one was good and, and it got some, 
got some nuggets that were like first introduced to the world through there. Yeah. And I, I mean, with so many questions right now for the eBay vault, like we will get a lot of answers that just he'll be able to walk us through the process a little bit. And I think mm. that would be huge. So to be able to be the first channel to get Nat on for a one on one, I'm I'm pretty excited about that. And yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it feels good. <laughs> yeah, that'll be cool. I'll be looking forward to that because a uh, lot lot of questions, a lot of unknowns for me. Obviously, someone with a very vested interest. I have I have over a million dollars between my own cards and then the majority consigner cards. So very very vested interest in in the time frame and, and then answering some of these like deeper questions about it. Yeah. And yeah, I'm still, <clears throat> I'm still confused too on like when you submit cards to PSA, like, will you now have to also submit like your username for your eBay account through PSA? Will you have to like connect those? Because right now there's, that's not integrated, right? Like when you submit cards to PSA, you're not submitting any of your eBay information. So does everybody have just have a vault number? You submit your eBay vault number to them. Is it, the, you know, I, I think the way it will work is every I, and this is me speculating. This is not me having insider information. This is not me knowing. But I think it will happen like within the ecosystem of PSA. And I think they will have their own eBay account, kind of like PWCC back in its heyday. Whether they'll do weekly auctions, whether they'll do monthly auctions, however they do that, I have no idea. But like, if I submit to PSA a, a bunch of celebrations Charizards, and then I opt to have them sent to the PSA vault, I don't think you'll know they're mine in, in any way whatsoever. I, I think it'll just show up amongst the other thousands or hundreds of thousands of other items that that other people have listed through their eBay vault on, sorry, PSA vault oh. on, on eBay. So that brings up four numbers that come straight to my mind, Dan. One zero nine nine. So what? Oh, what this, yeah. I mean, so if that's the case, if everybody out there is wondering what I mean, ten ninety nine. So if you're sending your cards to PSA and then PSA is selling your cards through their service, is it going to be the same way as if you submit cards to PSA? Or excuse me, not PSA. Same way you submit cards to PWCC or another consigner where they're not obligated to send you a 1099? I'd imagine. I mean, I, I've talked with my accountant. I have no legal obligation. I have no requirement to 1099 any of my consigners. If anything, they're actually paying me for a service to sell their cards. I'm just giving them the money that's theirs. So my accountant has told me, I've heard other accountants like not your dad CPA say the same thing. If anything, it would be you 1099 PSA for the, the commission that you pay to them. But you don't have to do that because you don't have to 1099 um, corporations or any or like businesses like that. Interesting. But yeah. it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter anyways, because everyone always should pay their taxes. And I, yes, <laughs> everyone always does pay their taxes. So that's not anything people have to worry about. But I'm just saying, in a hypothetical situation, if there's nefarious characters out there. <laughs> yeah, consignment services have long been utilized, not advocating for it, but they've long been utilized for lack of government documentation that, that uh, is generated when you sell through them, as opposed to your own eBay account. Yeah, but. And then it brings up the question of, is the eBay vault going to be something where, or the PSA, I, I'm going to be confused in names, the PSA yeah. vault, is it going to be strictly an auction platform or is it going to have the ability for buy it nows too? And then, yeah, that I don't can know. You, can you just lo go log on to your PSA vault and then look at the card the same way as you can do it with PWCC? PWCC, they have their own buy it now version or you could send stuff to auction. Is it going to be the same thing with you know, PSA, and then when you click that buy it now button, does it create a buy it now listing on that account? And if that's yep. the case, is this account going to have hundreds of thousands of cards going to be the most, I mean, that could be an event, right? Just watching that account nonstop, the amount of eyes you're going to get impressions. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually read, um, Zach, Gem at Pokemon posted a couple stories kind of like theorizing what what he thought this would be. And he, I think he's pretty spot on. Like, obviously he knows what he's talking about in the hobby and all that. <clears throat> but he said, um, kind of picture like PWCC cross eBay in its heyday functioning similarly, probably be a lot of like 
a, a bumpy ride. Uh, it'll be a bumpy ride at first. I'm sure there'll be some uh, hiccups. eBay Vault. eBay Vault was very similar. It, it, it was still today being described as in like a beta. I'd imagine the P PSA Vault will have opportunity, but it'll be like a little bit of a bumpy ride. But years out, if done correctly, and I think PSA has the capital. I think they have the ability. And then along with along with eBay, I'm I'm optimistic that they'll do something good with it. I'm just obviously a, a little bit uh a little bit bummed about losing what the eBay vault theoretically was going to become, right? Like three percent buyer's premium, zero selling fees, all, all that good stuff. It's it's gonna be similar, just a lot more expensive. <laughs> Do you think people would just be <clears throat> dumping cards to PSA now to take advantage of the service too? What one other good analog for this? It, it's kind of like what James ZNG Emporium Consignment Plus was, except for instead you're of having have James to pay for those grading fees up front. <laughs> well, and you're going to be paying up front probably. Yeah, yeah, you, you'd have to be. So you'd be paying up front. But yeah, I mean theoretically, like I'll probably throw something at it. I'll probably try something. I'll send a hundred random cards, like whatever they are, pr probably uh, a decent mix of things and, and just see what happens. It, it'll be uh, uh PWCC had a service like that. I think they still do. I tried that once. I never got around to using uh, James's consignment plus in, until, uh, until it was uh, gotten rid of, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, it'll be along those lines, right? It, it'll be interesting. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's just super fascinating, super interesting. And then, you know, are they going to tack on any like hidden fees? We don't know. Are there going to be any kind of like, I guess this is maybe more towards like the golden <laughs> auctions because they had, you know, the boomer premium. So if anybody doesn't know, boomer premium is just buyer's premium. Meaning if you buy an item, the same thing with PWCC, you got to tax yeah. on another 20% after you buy it. So people don't eat a lot of times, sometimes. People don't even take that into account. So you buy a hundred thousand dollar item. Next thing you know, you're paying one twenty because you get hit with that buyer's premium, and it could sneak up on you quick when you get to those higher dollar amounts. But uh, I'm curious if they're going to be tacking on any kind of like hidden fees in the back end too. I think one of the one of the ones that I never did, which was honestly like admittedly kind of dumb. I I do free shipping on all my listings. I just have like a higher minimum fee where I charge it. Uh, as like a consignment fee, but like ZNG Emporium, Probstein, DC Sports, all the consignment services have, e even PWCC, uh, they have like a $5 shipping fee uh, up to a certain value and then it goes to 10, then it goes to whatever. Um, so I I'm sure that PSA will probably charge like $4 shipping uh, on all their listings. So if you send to them, um, say you send uh, a Celebration Charizard, it grades a 10. I think they sell for like 180 today. You'll be you paying like a six. you know. If there's anybody who, who <laughs> knows what a celebration well, Charizard sells for, it's the man. I know on the that screen. I have 20 more coming from PSA that just came <laughs> back. I, I had a pretty bad sub that only 20 of my 40 got, got PSA 10s. But um my most but, recent one, like I, I'm sold out today. My most recent one sold for like 187. I, I usually sell them a little bit higher than they go, like at auction and stuff, but I think auctions have, have ticked back up uh months ago. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, I mean, Moonbrion doing Moonbrion things and Celebration Charizard somehow ticking back up too. <clears throat> but um, yeah, like, so say you send that Charizard, you pay a 16% fee. L let's just call it 200. Maybe you, you get a good auction result. Maybe you, I don't know if you'll be able to promote listing. Will you be able to do like the 2% the eBay promotion, 5% eBay promotion? Will that be a functionality through PSA on eBay? I'm not I'm not really sure, but for, for easy math, let's say you get 200 minus 32 bucks. I'm sure that they would have charged $5 shipping on that. So that's like a hidden fee and that it's something that the buyer's paying that you're not getting a percent of as the consigner. So uh, theoretically- the Sellers get in a percentage of that, you know? Yeah, th theoretically, if they were willing to pay 200 for the card and there's $5 shipping, they should only be bidding 195. But I think the way a lot of people's brain works is that they just bid 200 and they don't consider the shipping. They don't consider buyer's premiums. Like that's why- they obfuscate all, all the um all these things with buyers premiums and then they can say like oh well like PWCC will say we pay you 110% of what it sells for yeah well that's because the buyer pays 120% of what it sells for uh yeah. it's yeah. it's it's all silly <clears throat> but, uh, no i i don't know dan i think this is going to be just a 
game changer and it's this is like a perfect ideal situation that i could just send cards directly to psa and then i don't have to touch them i don't have to take photos of them i could potentially just go into my ebay vault and a couple clicks away from instantly listing those on auction or list them potentially as buy it now like this brings up another question too and what is this and i know people are gonna be like here we go pk pk talking shit on cgc and stuff but like <laughs> what kind of competitive advantage does this give psa over you know bgs or cgc or just anybody i mean obviously you pay more to grade with psa right now for uh, compared to just cgc mm. but how do you now compete with this especially if you're not a collector if you're doing this to flip how do you, how do you compete with this yeah it's it's pretty crazy um because obviously psa is making money selling through ebay like they've got some sweetheart deal due to their size due to who they are ebay is probably giving them i mean pro probably out of the gate psa is probably getting what like probe steam pays what like dc sports pays like probably far cheaper than, than zng emporium pays tca gaming like a, a lot of these uh Pokemon sellers, Pokemon consigners. So it, it's going to be tough. But but that said, um, I think there's still room. Like, I, I don't think these other consigning companies will just be completely dead, but it, it'll be a it'll be a, a pain point for sure. Like I intend to do in the future by some means, probably eBay buy now consignments. But pending what PSA comes up with, like maybe there won't be any room for that to happen and maybe it'll just go away. I, I don't really know for sure. But yeah, like I think PWCC has similar functionality with CGC, but the problem is one, it's CGC, it's not PSA, and two, it's PWCC and it's not eBay. Like like eBay's yeah. always been my number one. Um why PWCC <clears throat> was so like attractive at the beginning was because they sold it was on eBay. eBay. Like yep. that was it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you got the chat open, but the first key squid put up a great question. He says he's curious if they'll reduce your grading fees if you opt in to send to the vault instead of getting a return ship uh, to you. So by opting into the vault, you already instantly save on shipping. So yeah, that is a huge benefit. And especially return shipping is fairly expensive. Yeah, pack grading. I'm gonna about to yeah. send some packs again. You don't, you, you know, if James is out there, he's rolling his eyes. Consignment Plus is back so open. <laughs> if I could send packs and have them, you know, ship right to the vault, like I'm back in the game, baby. I'm back in the game. Yeah. But uh, so one, you don't have to pay the shipping fees, but yeah, he's right. Like, why can't PSA just release a special that says TCG special, twelve dollars a card with the caveat they have to go to the vault. Mm hmm. That's three dollars left to the card. So maybe by them doing a little discount of twelve dollars, people that have never used the vault service before, you know, people are, you know, they're encouraged by saving money. People are inherently cheap in this hobby. So maybe that little push of saving three dollars a card will be enough for people to submit to the vault just to try it out. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be really interested to see how it how it phases in. Um really it, it's crazy like I, I did not expect to wake up today you never do and, and just have some like uh, obviously this is a, a pretty decent sized portion of my business right now is ebay ebay vault my own stuff my consigner stuff and everything's just like turned on its head so many unknowns so many questions but i guess it keeps it exciting right uh almost three years full time now and i've been thrown for a loop a big loop multiple times now uh every, every year that i've been full time yeah. Do you think that this is probably the biggest news that has come out this year, though? Can you um, like for me, yes, absolutely. For for me, for my business, for the hobby, even, um, it's up there. I mean, it, it remains to be seen what it turns into. But I, I think uh, I'm trying to think what what other uh, big stuff like this year. It'll probably be uh, it'll probably be right up there with, with one of the stories of the year for sure. Do you think that there's a way where you could now integrate eBay Vault into your business though, like in a different way than you're currently doing? Because obviously P PSA it's a Vault, yeah, right now. But... Um, I think yeah, like I think some opportunity opens up sub two fifty. 
I, I think uh, not having to take those cards in, not having to do the photos, the lit, like being able to just send in the raw and get the money back when, when it sells on the other side, right? After auction, after buy it now, it, it definitely, it's just a, a different animal. There's a different way to interact with it. Um, I think there's a lot less applications for me personally than the eBay vault had on the, on the 250 plus being, whether it was like, even if eBay vault, went to 5% selling fees, 5% buyer premium, 10% buyer's premium, 10% would have been tough because it's not like significantly lower than the 12. But even yeah. if it went more than the three that they were stating, if it went to six, if it went to seven, there was a lot of room to do stuff there. Um, whereas this one, it's like, it's nice. It's nice to get the, the labor outsourced. It's nice to get the storage outsourced. But it's fairly expensive though too. It's definitely still fairly expensive. And I imagine I'd have a hard time believing they wouldn't have both buy it now and auction opportunities. I'd be shocked if it was auction only, but remains to be seen. No, uh, could you ever see yourself going the ZNG route and doing a consignment plus style or no, it's just way too much risk to front up all that. Or... I, I actually, I don't talk about it like publicly very much, but I'm actually are already doing consignment plus through my eBay vault consignments. I, I've been doing it for a year now, probably uh, since before I got into the eBay vault. Actually, I started my buy it now consignments. I forget when exactly like a year and a half ago now, maybe. And um, no, I, when I mean consignment plus, <clears throat> I'm saying when you ship their cards to PSA for grade and then you're covering the fees and then, you know, oh, yeah, I, I guess I don't know how much demand there would be for that just because they could do it themselves. But I mean, they can do the eBay vault themselves, right? And I'm charging there one to four percent. It, it helped like, bankrupt James, so there's demand for that. It may, I might be completely, I probably am wrong here, but I see a, a slight possibility Ooh. that they might have like post pay options available. If they, like, say you, you click a box, I want these to just be fire sold on seven day auction immediately once they come back, they might allow you to wait because they have your credit card. They have your payment details, right? Um, Like wow. what's the chance on you a, a week later skipping the bill? The, the same risks are there of them trying to charge your order and then you charging back that order or your credit card not having sufficient funds. You know what I'm saying? It's like they've already done the labor. They've already done the work. Yeah, There's no more it... risk. But in that mm. case, like if they charge a credit card and it doesn't go through, they're not going to send you your cards, you know? So they have some leverage there. Whereas if the cards are worthless, like, like say worst case scenario, so it happened. It happened to some people for sure. Like during the boom, the, the 14 million card backlog that, that took two years, there are absolutely like, I don't know how many people may, maybe ask that how many people didn't pay for their PSA orders. We know Ludkins, we know like all those issues that happened with middlemen. But I guarantee you, there were some amount of people that submitted direct to PSA, absolute trash, like 500 cards, like like a, a $7,500 order, and they didn't pay. And then it was trash. So PSA, like what's PSA going to do with these worthless cards? At least in the event of it being auctioned, at least they recovered something, right? It's like they already did all the labor anyways, a little bit more labor of getting it sold on eBay, sold through, fulfilled, but they got a little bit of pay for that if the... If the um the bill that comes due, say it's a seventy five hundred dollar bill, like worst case scenario, a, a max five hundred card order, and say it only nets like twenty five hundred on eBay, so it's a five thousand dollar bill. Well, yeah, sure they might charge you back. It might bounce on the credit card, but the seventy five hundred might have bounced on the credit card anyways. Like th there's always some risk to PSA of of a uh, submitter not paying. Interesting. I wonder. Th that's my thoughts. Again, no idea. I I'm just. I'm I'm guessing here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and you got to figure too with a huge year long backlog too. I'm sure a lot of those credit cards, they just, you know, expiration dates expired yep. and, you know, they probably try to email people like, Hey, update your payment information. Never got updated. I'd be curious how many just cards PSA are sitting on that were never paid. Like you mentioned. And will this give them an out of to like start to liquidate all these cards? And I said it before too, like fairly morbid, but in a two year time span, I mean, life expectancy is what, 80 years in a yeah. two year time span, roughly one in 40. I mean, you do the math on like some percentage of people will die. Right. And, yeah. and I mean, especially in the sports card hobby, a little bit more like aged uh, demographic, 
some amount of people literally submitted cards in, in the next year to two years, they, they passed away. And what did PSA do with all those cards? What did the middlemen do? Like, um, obviously, that was no way to do business. Uh, and I, I am very bullish on PSA, CGC, BGS, them never allowing turnaround times to exceed like six months again. That, that was so foolish, so silly to not do the basic third grade mathematics. Um, I don't think they'll allow that to happen again. <laughs> I saw a screenshot today where somebody submitted a bulk order on April 1st and it was already like, it's already gone through the grading phase. It's into assembly, which is my 40 card, my 40 celebrations Charizards. I'll check right now. I, I'm normally not a tracker checker at all, but it, it, my grades actually hit. Let, let me see when that I sent that in. I sent that in. Um, Let me see. I didn't even know you check your grades when you get that grade email. I thought you just... I always get, I always check the email for sure. Um, I sent these on, I don't even know where to check. I say... sent those on May, uh, sorry, March 20th. Wow. That, that, that was bulk 1399 a card, 40 celebrations Charizards. And I have the grades. I don't physically have them yet, but I got the grades like two days ago. I got the grades Monday, I think. That's wild. Who yeah. I mean, Ten dollars a grade in is possible. I'm telling you, like I don't think we're too far away from ten dollars a card grading. We've already they've already been dabbling with thirteen ninety nine these specials and stuff. I think ten's possible because they got to you got to get more volume. I think something like this though, like they're gonna keep it like no matter what Nat says, he says he's for the collectors. All the articles that were written today about this, it's for the collectors. <laughs> They're for the bottom line, uh, and yeah. I'm not faulting them for that. I, I'm a I business. That's... I'm for the bottom line. I'm I'm not I'm not gonna lie to you and say that I'm for the collector. <laughs> I'm for like I, I'm not gonna I'm not so much for the money that I will like scam or cheat or lie or steal, but I am for my bottom line, uh, morally, legally, all that good <laughs> rainbow fuzzy stuff. But I'm not gonna lie and say that like collectors are my number one priority. They are not gnats. They are not collectors either. Um, I I, I will say that it's in the name, <laughs> but um, if they wanted to do ten dollars, like I, I'm not saying either that they could just to, do ten dollars tomorrow. I think if they did ten dollars tomorrow, it wouldn't go to two year backlog. It wouldn't go to fourteen million card backlog, but it would go like too high. There, there's no reason for them to go to ten sooner than they have to. And I think that something like this, something like um, the periodic specials, it's like do a special for 14, do a special for 13, for 12, for 11. Go to 10 like as slowly as possible. Maybe you never have to go there. Maybe maybe this whole PSA vault thing, all this consignment plus thing that they're doing, maybe that gets enough demand where they can get that million cards a month and, and not have to go lower. Because it's all about that equilibrium point, right? Like yeah. PSA needs to charge the, the proper amount to make sure that their inflow meets their outflow because if the inflow exceeds the outflow, you build a backlog. If, if the inflow is less than the uh, outflow, they're sitting on their hands, making no money. Right. So um, that's the lever that they have to adjust how many cards come in. And as of right now, like they're doing a good job. <clears throat> Let me uh, get conspiracy theorist, Dan. What do you, do you think this was eBay's plan all along? Because this conversation couldn't have been something that just took place last week and then they sealed the deal today, right? Like this had to be something that had been in the work at works, I'm gonna guess, for months, right? Like you know, yeah. there was multiple pieces with golden auctions going to eBay and the vault going to PSA. This had to have been in the works for a while now. Yeah, the the three percent buyers premium felt too good to be true. Like obviously we knew zero percent selling in the eBay vault was too good to be true. They told us in the future it was going to be 3% buyer's premium. I was very skeptical on, on that being real, but uh, it, it might have never been real. Like, cause It's going on a year now, it, probably about a year. I, I think um, I, I got in early to the eBay vault. I want to say I got in like last June, so, so maybe 10 months or so. I was later than Rusty. I, I know that they made those promotional videos with Rusty, with Probstein, with other people of, of the very first like early birds into the eBay vault. Shortly after I got in, and then a couple months later, maybe like last August or so, uh, everyone was able to get in. At that point, they probably they probably knew by last August that something was going to happen, and that three percent buyer's premium in the future was like never really going to be a real thing. Uh, I, I think that's not like even too 
you, you don't have to have too thick of a tinfoil hat for that. <laughs> I mean, how long do you think like this was happening for this? It had to have been. I don't know. I mean, this got to be so many moving pieces for something like this. I, I talked with eBay. eBay's plan because well, like I talk with eBay and I I've been I meet with them like monthly and I have discussions with them. They never give me anything. Uh, um, I don't know how much of that was like they can't give anyone anything or how much of that was like they know in the back of their mind that it's all going to change drastically two months, six months, whatever the timing was. Like, I, I don't know. Um, uh, so FOMO table says, just got in guys, elaborate what you mean by PSA acquiring eBay vault. It's, it's literally in the name of the title. Like that's exactly what happened. PSA has acquired eBay vault. So, and if you just do me a favor, just go back to the beginning of the video. We kind of do a breakdown of it too. But, uh, I think it's huge for the hobby. <laughs> uh, Danny said Z and G will have to start back to submitting cards for people. No, oh, it's it's wild though. I just this is like one of the biggest news events just I could ever remember, and I think maybe it's big for us because we're doing this every day, you know. Maybe for the average person, this doesn't really matter, you know? Maybe people just, they don't do enough volume to really make it matter. But there's going to be people now that are, like, going to be able to create, like, entire careers behind this service if it's rolled out properly. Mm -hmm. Like, the amount of money that could potentially be made, especially if you can start to move this at scale and really, really figure out, like, a good system for turning and burning cards, you know? Because now, at this point, one of the things that was like always a detriment for a lot of people is you there's decent percentage, but the margins are just not great, right? So it's like, okay, I could buy a card for two dollars, I could grade it for fifteen, and I could sell it for twenty three you're gonna make a make some money there right but people are going to say it's not worth their time it's not worth the headache right well now what if you, you can take do off that? all that time yeah. yeah you can do that at scale now you've eliminated all the headaches that were involved in that and now you can start doing that at a large scale and you can sell a thousand of those cards two thousand and that's just for a $23 card. Well, what if you can scale that into $30 cards and 40 and 50 and really, really make it worth it for you now where those cards maybe weren't worth it for you then? Like when you're all into a card for $17 and you're making $2 a card, those are still okay margins when you're talking about instant turning and burning your money. Like you get that card in hand you put it in a in a penny sleeve in a card saver one. You ship that, like that. Those are great margins, right? I don't know. Yeah, uh, great. Well, one thing, one thing that I wonder too is like, I'm imagining you'll still have to do the PSA submission form. One thing that would be great, like one thing that was great about James, I I never used it, but you could just send him five hundred cards. And they would do the entry into PSA and yeah. then they would create the listing. I don't think this will be that. So I, I guess consignment plus for James consignment plus, if I wanted to do it, it would still be a thing because there will be people that don't want to submit to PSA. There will be people that if PSA is charging up front before the auction, they don't want to do that. So if James or if myself or if whoever wanted to offer where, Hey, I'm going to enter into PSA for you yeah. and I'm, I'm going to, just shield you from that one one step removed, and and will PSA take on international clients? I'd imagine they will because they have international like they have the J Japanese location. They have um, I don't know a, a lot of speculation, but it it'll be definitely be a big change. It'll be interesting to see how like um these first to market plays go. Uh, obviously, you're you're making it a couple steps shorter. You don't have to go through that last shipping where, where people are taking the scans. From uh from PSA to list that listing five day auction whatever um now it'll just be 
It'll be at PSA already, pop it on, boom. Th those first the markets will be a couple days quicker to market, I guess, even. Um, and and to kind of like hash down my point a little bit is you just mentioned I was just had a pile of cards in front of me. You always mentioned the celebrations Charizard, but like these are two more celebration cards. Now at scale, when you're doing none of the work, these are a play now. If you can I hit the, tens on, them. yeah. And if you get like, like, say you send twenty of each of those, yeah, and you get like all nines and an eight. Well, then you get you'll get, it get up on that. It gets dark so, really quick. It gets dark, <laughs> but when you talk about celebration Charizards and you get all eights on them, it's the same boat because now your cost raw on those. What is the cost raw? Like seventy bucks, eighty bucks. Yeah. So if you get all eights, it's the same thing. It, yeah. There's no difference. I mean, it's just you got to be a good pre-grader. You got to get those tens. And I'm I'm not positive on this either, but say you send in 100 cards, what would be ideal and what I think they will eventually do, like maybe it won't be out the gate. Ideally, you could pick like, I want these 80 to come home yeah. and I want these 20 to go to the vault and I want these 10 to be auction and I want these 10 to be buy it now. Like maybe initially it will be all or nothing. Like they all have... No, I I hope though, and I, I'd imagine that they would get that I, functionality where you could just choose. I think they all go to your vault. I think that's like the Maybe. same way as they do now. So you could you have one of two options: you could ship to yourself, or you could ship to the vault. I think when you hit ship to the vault in your vault, you're now going to have an option that just to withdraw, to withdraw, or to send to eBay. It will just be yeah. a matter of you go into your vault. You click send to eBay, and then hopefully there's one more click that says send to eBay, buy it now, or you know for like a fixed price or auction. That's what I'm hoping. Yeah, the godly Shad brings up a good point. Like a lot of margins are already very very thin. If if everyone starts doing this, if everyone has that ease of accessibility to do this, the margins will just disappear a lot quicker, right? Like if you can just literally send a thousand yeah. cards and print five thousand dollars for free everyone will do that until you can't do that anymore <laughs> how how many things in this hobby have we said that about i know i know that that I is mean, fair <laughs> can, can you name a product in this hobby where that exact sentence hasn't been said like everybody's gonna do it the margins are gonna evaporate yeah there will be no money to be like, made like look look at moon brian look at Look, Evolve his guys. Look at modern look at seal Garantino, right now. Look at yeah, yeah. Just, <laughs> you name it. Look at seal product, whatever. Like you name it. The conversation, that exact conversation has already been. And one of the things about this hobby is it just over and over and over again shows you how strong it is. So uh so Garen M said PSA 10 celebration Zapdos is dark. LL he has a stack as proof. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not familiar with what that goes for, but uh, so yeah. sounds like it's bad. <laughs> when I hit tens of cards like that, those are just like forty nine ninety nine buy it nows, and you just hope somebody comes by and scoops up one. Put a five percent promotion on them. Yeah. What are they selling for? Are you looking at right now? Low list buy it now is twenty nine ninety nine. Oh, that is that is dark. <laughs> for a yeah. PSA 10. Yep. But it, and I see some auctioning for like sub twenty, mid twenties. Wow. Okay, that's really yeah. dark then. So maybe yeah. <laughs> that's not a play. But it it just shows you. I don't. I mean, I guess we could get into it a little bit, but it just shows you like for the high end of the market. When I say high end, I'm saying high end of set. So you know, high end is the chase. It's crazy what the high end of celebrations does versus what the low end. So I would say that that Zapdos is like on the lower end. But the high end, the premium for the chase, I don't know why it always exists, but it always does. It's just like the Moonbrion. The demand's there. The Charizard from Celebration. The demand's there. And the Charizard from Celebration is a reprint of a vintage card. And people tell me all the time people don't like vintage cards. So I don't know what's going on. Yeah. The the hobby is ever ever changing, but it's some things are just always the same though too. It, it it's pretty crazy. It's yeah. it's it's a fun ride. <laughs> Do you ever feel it's in a in a small way like a 
like you're in the movie Groundhog's Day and things just always are repeating itself. It's just things Yeah. repeat <laughs> itself, but like the set, the name is a little different. Maybe the chase card in the set's a little different, but like things just keep playing out almost exactly the same, you know? Mm. And the godly shad says the big boys will eventually come in and eat the profits. Enjoy it while you can. I think this is great for the big fish, bad for the small fish. And then um, classics wanted him to elaborate. I, I think just inherently now it costs a lot more money to sell your cards. Like eBay vault. Maybe it was never real. Maybe it was just this thing dangled in front of us to entice a bunch of cards in that, that will then get transferred over to PSA. But, um, Obviously, if that future could have existed, if that future could have been real, it's better for collectors to be able to buy and sell their cards for a 3% buyer's premium as opposed to 7 to 16%, right? Um, I, I think increased liquidity and in all this is, is good for everybody, but fees just went up a ton. Like, There's no way around the fact that fees just went up a ton for everybody, and I think overall that, that probably disproportionately hurts the small guy more than it hurts the big guy, right? Frictional cost being high is uh, th that money's being taken out of the hobby. That money's going into collector's valuation. That money's going into e eBay's dividends and things like that. Yeah. Thinking on the low end, when you add in 3% fees, but you're not paying shipping, do you actually, assuming you're doing free shipping, do you actually make out better? Because let's just say shipping's for sub $200 card, $4, right? Yep. So by adding an extra 3%, uh, no, you're not. Well, we'll say you sell a hundred dollar card. If I sell a hundred dollar card, That's on theoretically, the high. Um, yeah, so. it, it, it should go for 95 and I'd get 84% of 95, right? So it'd be, um, I'd get 80 bucks. Whereas if I sold it myself for a hundred, I'd pay five to ship it. And then I'd pay 12% fees. I'd get like 82 or 83, but, but Okay. that's my own time too. So I'm paying, you're paying like two or three bucks to sell a hundred dollar card. depending on how many cards you can fulfill. Like I kind of figure like a minute or two to do the listing, a minute or two to fulfill it on, on the um very cautious end. I figure I can fulfill like, I I'm talking like source, photograph, list, pack and ship 12 cards an hour. What one card every five minutes, but obviously the numbers change drastically when you have a stock photo with a with hundred cards that you sell through one listing, the numbers change drastically. Don't feel bad for me, Limp, Limp Biscuit. I'll be fine. <laughs> it, it is funny, though. I, I actually, I posted a meme in Discord earlier. Um, j Just the paywall Discord. I didn't share it anywhere else, but maybe I will. Um, You, you know that one where it's like death is walking down the hallway and And then he's there's knocking like, on the doors. there's the doors and there's like the blood. So Yeah. a couple years ago or a year and a half ago, Troll and Toad Evo, I, I was pivoting my business heavily towards Troll and Toad Evo and, and that died. And MetaZoo, I, I put in there as like a meme. MetaZoo was not like a massive thing to me, but like 5% of my business, maybe it, it died just a few months ago. And then today eBay vault. So it's like, I actually, um, I, I've talked about it a little bit on my own live streams, but I'm in the process of getting approved and, and up and running on eBay live. So I made that meme where it was like trolling toad Evo and then MetaZoo and then eBay vault. And it's like, I'm, I'm sorry, Nick, but I, I've killed all these other things. I'm going to kill eBay live next, probably. yeah so they're knocking Um, on the door at eBay yeah. live so is it going to be you join eBay live and then they just open the floodgates and everybody joins And then, or they, or they sell it to whatnot. yeah <laughs> Imagine. Yeah. Like everything that I point my business towards just dies. So like, watch out whoever I go to next. I mean, e eBay live is a segment of my business moving ahead. So may, may, or modern Pokemon investing. May, maybe I should have put that on the, uh, the, the final door because I'm kind of, Kind of embracing that a little bit in my last couple of videos. Yeah, so uh, I heard you're picking up Modern <clears throat> Sealed and you're paying 95%. that, that is like the extreme example. I, I'm actually, I've not done my full inventory yet, but there are certain amounts of every set that I want to have going back to Sword and Shield. And if I want to have 10 cases of, say, Brilliant Stars, and if I only have seven, I will like I will buy three of them at 100% of market. So instead of doing that, why don't I just buy them at 90, 95%, right? Um, Because if it'll you only if be you're a doing very that limited right amount. now, Dan, we could do ninety five percent of TCG player, and I'll go on PokemonCenter.com and I'll ship 
well, a box and, of brilliant stars to you and a box of lost origins to you right now. And I guess that's one caveat because I've had a few people that, that have sent me lists of like battle academies or or like collection by this is for booster cases only and it, it's not 95 percent strictly of tcg player it's 95 percent of what i can get it for like like low list between ebay sure. tcg player um yeah 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 pokemon just, center if that's the one like i know you're no, i know paying, paying 95 percent of tcg on lost origin and most of the ones available on Pokemon Center, I already have the amount that I want, so I would buy more. But that would be closer to the eighty. That that would be closer to the eighty. Can I ask you what do you like? How much uh, Brilliant Stars and Lost Origin did you want to get? Part of it will be seeing what all the numbers are. Like I, I have a rough idea. I, I probably have only like eight ish cases of, of both of those right now. Okay. I would probably go in and some of it will be like phased in. I, I know some people just say they're buying at 70%, 70%, like as if it's eternal for me personally, it's more like, like maybe <clears throat> say I have eight lost origin and I want 12. I would buy four cases. If someone had them all at once, I would buy them at 95% to get to that number. Yeah. But once I get there, it's like, well, maybe I'd be fine having 20 cases, but I'm going to buy my next four at like, 90%. And if if 20 people email me all at once and say, hey, I've got four cases of this, well, now to some extent, it becomes like, well, I'm not going to pay 95%. I'm, I'm going to pay 85% because there's more out there available than I, like, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, obviously, I'm going to I'm gonna pay uh, relevant to, like, what I have. And and I, I've actually had quite a few buys already just from dropping it in my last couple lives and videos. I, I've been buying loose packs, too. Uh, part of it Going into the eBay Live, like I, I want to have a bunch of broken down ETBs. I want to have broken down collection boxes. I want to have like a lot of packs to rip. Interesting. <clears throat> what What's your uh, position? Yeah, I mean, we don't have to get into it too much, but what I'm about super Evolve transparent. <laughs> Evolving skies. Have you? Because uh, I know you you sold all your cases, and then you you mentioned God probably like four months back that you were planning on picking up another position in Evolving skies. Is that something you've been building on the? in the background i think i have i i've only bought like back during when i made that video of spending like 100 grand in one week i think i bought around two cases worth then but but i think it was a sealed case and loose boxes i've sold a couple because i've had a couple people message me and i, I i've sold a couple but um i'm not listed i'm on like tcg player or ebay or anywhere but i probably have as of today it's either one or two sealed cases. I don't remember if I have a second sealed case or not. And then I might have like 12 to 15 loose boxes. Like I, I do not have a ton given what the price is. I'm not like super keen to add a ton more. I actually had, I, I probably have in my email right now, Um, <clears throat> I probably have two to four cases of Evolving Skies in my emails right now. Most of them want like 3,700, 3,800 PayPal friends and family. And I, I think I I think I did the math on it. Low list on eBay. There might be one at like right at forty two hundred. I, I want to say I offered thirty five hundred. Well, let me double check my math. Thirty five hundred on forty two hundred would be eighty three percent. I I know I offered thirty five hundred to like a few different people, and one of them came back with thirty six. I think some came back at like thirty seven, thirty eight. I'm fine adding a couple at thirty five hundred, but I'm also fine not adding them too. Like I I'm not really like in love with that at that price but um uh, if they come in they come in if they don't they don't like that's um it, it's 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 paid after the item gets to me i'll pay you friends and family if you want it up front it's goods and services uh I, i've done it both ways depending on the person there's so much of this stuff <clears throat> sitting out there right now i know people don't want to hear that i know that's like a that no that's a trigger warning for a lot of people i just to say that there's less than some people think. There's more than other people think. Like yeah. it, it, it it's a lot shades of, of gray. It. Like when you compare yeah. <laughs> it, compare it to sun and moon, compare it to X, Y, compare it to black and white, compare it to platinum or heart gold, soul, silver. Trust me. Yeah. There's a lot of this stuff that exists out there and a lot of people are sitting on it. And with that, but now this is a caveat. With that said, it's still super impressive how many people are still buying this stuff the way they are and how many people are not just fire sailing it which is yeah. great 
yeah, it's it's wild how well it's performed. Like I've the whole modern investing thing is something that I've done the whole time. Like semantics, I never really called it investing, blah, blah, blah. But um uh, I'm doing it at a higher level now because I'm I'm doing everything at a higher level. I'm full time now. Like like 10 years ago, I was not full time in this. I was not 34 years old with the financial foundation that I have, no debt, no, no mortgage, no any of that. Uh, so I'm, I'm doing it at a bigger level now because I'm, I'm doing everything at a little bit, le little bit bigger of a level. It's, um, I mean, you look at like Moonbrion, you look at what Moonbrion's doing. You look at the numbers, you look at the pop, you do the math, 1,000 packs to pull it. There's 12,000 at PSA, 12,000 tens. So it's like the amount of millions of packs that were open to get that. Like it, it's all, it's all crazy. Uh, I, so let me ask you for, because you, this question matters, like, because you do, e or you do, you're doing eBay, you're doing Pokemon full time, you're turning and burning stuff. And a big part of your business is grading cards. So are you a little worried that you're leaving like a lot of opportunity cost out there just by now picking up sealed product and stuck, sticking it away in the corner somewhere? Because if anybody's going to make the argument that they could do more with that money, I feel like you would be that person. Or do you just feel that the returns for modern are just so enticing right now that maybe the opportunity cost that you're losing out on isn't that great in comparison? I'm just curious. And you're the best person to ask this question to because you do this full time and you've been very successful not losing out on opportunity costs. So. I'll, uh, well, I, I've definitely, I mean, I, I was a MetaZoo partner. I, I did rip 5,000 packs, 10,000 packs of some MetaZoo sets during, with, with that time, I could have been making a lot more money in Pokemon, obviously. For me, like I, I always say we're in the same arena, different games, different rules, all that stuff. We're at different parts in our journey too. 10 years ago, I had a lot more time. 10 years ago, I was, I was still a bachelor. I, I was not yet married 10 years ago. I, I was engaged. I, I was cohabitating with, with my fiance, now wife. Um, no kids yet. I had tons of time. So back then it didn't make, and I had a lot less capital too. So it didn't make sense when I had tons of time and a lot less capital. It made sense to buy collections, grade them, churn them, do all that stuff. I needed every, every penny of liquidity that I had, every penny of cash flow that I had, I had to put into that. To, to be able to like, like my, my time exceeded my capital. I'm at a point now where it's like, um, and I, some people get like really butthurt when I say it lately, <laughs> I have more capital, more cash flow than I can feasibly. Like I, I can't just deploy all my capital and have all of it out at grading. Like I, I can't spend it all to some extent. And nice thing about, um, should, Modern I, should I give a humble brag warning to chat right now? Because if, yeah. if, Care, if Care Bear is out there watching this, I think he's in bed right now, but he'll be watching this tomorrow. He's in the I, comment I, section right now, just typing up a storm. Yeah, it is what it is, right? Like, I, I'm not trying to say it bragging or anything. Part, part of it is like very, very like granular, very honed in on just my personal situation. I'm working nights right now. Like I, I'm probably working barely 40 hours a week most weeks so my time is like extremely limited I, I guess my time is opening up a little bit coming soon because the ebay vault's going away and, and maybe a large portion of my consignment business is going away but i focused on that because that's like a lot higher dollar per hour with a lot less of my own capital and it's a very high hourly rate so i'm, I'm gonna make a video in the in the coming weeks my video monday now will probably be about the ebay vault but my oh, yeah. video the following monday will probably be about like well Every dollar that I see, I just, I, I, I picture these buckets and I fill the most valuable, the most like best ROI buckets. And, and then once that one runs over, I go to the next one, the next one, the next one. Time is the same way. Like I try to spend my time in the best dollar per hour while I'm doing business. But overall, like my best return on time, my best return on investment for my time is spent with like family and friends and stuff. Like I'm trying to enjoy life too and all that. So it, it's, uh. I, I see Jake came in, but I don't see his camera on yet. <clears throat> I'll, I'll stop my rant once he pops his camera on. <laughs> but yeah, I'm trying to optimize like my whole time thing, my whole money thing. And Modern Sealed is nice in a lot of ways because it's literally you just, you buy it, you put it into a corner and you deal with it later. And you can tie up like a fair bit of capital. You, you can kind of use up a lot of that cash flow liquidity after, after all your 401ks and IRAs are funded. 
and uh, it doesn't take up much much of my time. So so that's why in this time period, and maybe six months from now, maybe things change, maybe my cash flow is tighter, maybe my time is more significantly available, and I, I change things. Do you, do you feel like risk tolerance wise? Do you feel your risks? You just take you're getting more risky though, because the way you just talked about how when you got into the hobby versus now, where when money was a little bit tighter, you had to really take less risk. You had to whatever you were doing, you had to know that it was going to pay out for you. Do you feel like you're just taking too many risks? Hey, Jake, good to see you, buddy. Glad you hopped on. How you guys doing? I definitely Good want to hear you. your take on the whole eBay PSA vault situation too. Sure. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> where, where are you guys at in that conversation? How long have you guys been going? <laughs> uh, we've been going for about an hour. So we, uh, we did talk about it a lot. We're just pretty much saying like what the implications of something like that could be. And, did, was it something that was even like remotely on your radar as something that you thought could happen? Because one of the beautiful things about the eBay vault and Dan's mentioned it, you know, right now, 0% seller fees and w then they were going to roll out 3%, but now it looks like it's going to be way more. I don't know. Just what are your overall thoughts on it? I think it's, it's a hard part about being a reseller in this business. You You don't really bring a lot of value <laughs> moving one thing from one place to another other than sort of your and so you're sort of at the whim of these kind of larger companies and so i think it's just part of the nature of the game that these companies are going to do what's best for them if, if if they're too good of a service they're going to eventually raise their fees and start charging if, if we're making too much money they're going to start wanting a cut of that money and we rely on them um so you know, it's, it's a, it, it's a tough, it, listen, it stinks. I mean, it's, it's a bummer <laughs> for, for anyone who has a huge business, you know, or, or trying to have a huge business. It's, it's, um, you know, it, it, it can massively change things, not, not to mention all the consignment stuff and, you know, that I know Dan has built and that I've started to do. I mean, there's all sorts of things. It's frustrating that, that, um, we were told that it was going to be 3% and we weren't told anything about, you know, that they were going to potentially sell the company, you know, but like that's, these things happen all the time and everything. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, um, you know, you can, I think it's, you know, we could be like, oh, we're all going to boycott or, you know, or take our business elsewhere to try to get them to change the decision or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, if if their fees are too high, they won't get business and they'll be forced to lower their fees. If their fees are not too high and we're still making good money and their service is still worth using, people are still going to use it. Um, so I do think the monopoly element of what's going on is um, is concerning. But you know, what are we gonna? There's going to be a regulatory government agency that's going to come in and say you can't. You're not allowed to own the grading card company, the major auction house. You know, it's like besides that, there's not much that we can do other than um, now they need us to win in order for them to win. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be some balance because if we all stop using, if there's no money, if there's zero money for us to make as resellers, then we will stop using it, and that will and that will be a problem for them uh, theoretically or potentially, unless they're just targeting consumers um you know but but in my mind the whole like uh the idea that you can like send out a bunch of cards to get graded and then it can directly go to this vault which theoretically can can save you like time and money and and sell easily it just seems built for people who want to sell their cards um yeah. not not so much people who are collectors who want to physically have their cards i know as a collector for me i i want to physically have my cards the ebay vault doesn't doesn't appeal to me as a collector so much it, it really appeals to me as a business personally but uh but others might just enjoy having a card and and then just storing it there because they don't want it to get stolen or they're they're anxious about having a high value card i mean there could be other reasons why why they would put it there but that's I don't know, those are like my uh my short-term thoughts it's a it's a bummer it's i was planning on using it a lot and have been using it a lot and I've been making a lot of money with it. I mean, 0% fees is insane. I mean, the way eBay vault 
it's a silly, it's it's ridiculous. And frankly, three percent seem too good to be true. I mean, three yeah. percent is incredibly we good. We went we went over that part, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so now sixteen percent or whatever on lower than a hundred. I forget exactly what I mean. There were some that it felt like like, you know, but maybe they're starting high and they're actually going to have some specials or maybe you'll get some off if you're like a PSA member, you grade with PSA, maybe there'll be some deals. Who knows what's going to happen with all of that, but it is what it is. And the lesson at the end of the day is like these, these places are all businesses. So they're going to do what's in their, what mathematically what's in their best interest. And you as a business have to have to think strategically that way also and not not depend too much on any you know on any one of these platforms and you should go to the platform that makes the most sense for you um and and keep yourself you know fairly um adaptable i would say so that you can you can maneuver you know around these types of hiccups and you're 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 not um putting too much time energy or, or, or too much of your business structure on, like if you're doing razor thin margins in this hobby and you're dependent on these, these places keeping their same fees, like that's a, that's an anxious place to be. Um, but if you have very large margins and, you know, and you can give up some of that to these companies and you have multiple places to sell and you're, you're, Maybe you're streaming, you're selling on eBay, you're selling on au other auction houses, you're selling, you know, it shows that way you'll, you'll, um, I think this will be, I think for most people, this will, this, this is not going to be a huge deterrence from starting a business or continuing a business, but it, it sort of took away this thing that was almost too good to be true, I guess, uh, it, it is kind of the way it feels a little bit to me. See, this is why it's good to bring on multiple people. You definitely brought like a fresh view that I don't think we really talked about more because I I'm a little bit more positive of it because mm -hmm. I'm I'm excited about just like how it could roll out into the future with like the streamline of just submitting the PSA, so PSA submits it to the vault for you, and then hopefully you go into your vault and it's as simple as buy it now or to auction, and then potentially how is that going to roll out? Do you integrate your eBay account or does it go through like the PSA, like their PWCC account? So they sell on their account, which means no 1099s. Like those are all the things I was thinking. But yeah, I mean, you just said so, too about businesses too. Like it really does. Yeah, it hurts for businesses. So I don't like things necessarily getting easier because I'm willing to do, just to be completely honest as a business, I'm sort of willing to do the hard work sure. and some of the stuff that other people may not really love to do. So from a competitive standpoint, the fee structure change is the killer. And I didn't mind, I would, I did not mind doing the work for that, that fee structure. Obviously if somehow they could keep the fee structure the same and, but that was just not going to happen. Like if it's easy and everyone can do it, they're going to charge a lot more and then consumers are going to come in who are not businesses who are not trying to cut costs and cut it, cut every penny and be willing to, to, to use it. And, and so anyway, so it's a constantly moving, um, your, your competitive advantage in this is constantly shifting and, and, and moving. So this is just a, you just have to sort of adapt, but yeah, but as far as, um, I, I, you know, particularly for people who aren't full time doing this, for for those people who who just want to do like some grading and they're making large margins on their grading, it might be worth the sixteen percent just to not have to think about it and be able to send a lot more. Like there could be people who, even if they're making less money uh, on the margin, their liquidity is so much better and they're able to do so much more that that it you know it it works better for them, which is great, you know. Um, I, you know, I hope it's really good for a lot of people. It's okay if it's bad for me, you know, so it is what it is. <laughs> well, and you mentioned a little bit, I heard you use the word monopoly and me and Dan touched on this a little bit, but I, I asked Dan the question, now I'm going to ask you the same one. It's just, if PSA is such a streamlined process, like what's the point to grade with these other companies at this point now, you know, especially if that's like what you're trying to do is 
as PSA keeps making stuff easier, and I was saying to Dan, I saw uh, somebody had cards received for bulk at PSA April 1st, and they're already in assembly 10 days later. Not 10 business days, just 10 days later. They got crazy fast turnaround times right now. You know, the cards sell for a premium now that they're going to roll out this uh, new service. It just, but competition's supposed to be good for this hobby. This, if anything, this is going to drive out the competition. So, do you feel anybody else could compete, or we just get into the point where there's just going to be one? Did you want to say something, Dan? I don't think CGC or BGS are going to go away. Um, I think it's more healthy in some ways if they're a larger market share and if, if PSA is having to continue to innovate. But just fundamentally, like they're different products and they have different consumer bases. Like even though they're very similar in a lot of ways, like they are quite different too. And they just cater to different people. Um, I, I think one risk that, that PSA runs here is cannibalizing a lot of the early margins and increasing a lot of the frictional costs, which is what this is fundamentally doing. Uh, like if PSA prices go down, their ability to charge higher grading fees and their ability to get more submissions in for higher grading fees is hurt. So they have to lower their fees to get as many, to entice more cards in, right? Like uh, as Jake said, they need you to make money for you to keep submitting. So if this higher frictional cost and this quicker to market destroy some of the margins like they might be forcing themselves to go to 10 six months or a year sooner than they otherwise would have like we will never know we only get to live in this universe we currently live in we, we don't see all the parallel universes the parallel outcomes but that's like that's a potential that's a possibility that uh just an interesting thought experiment i guess i think that's a that's a good point <clears throat> is that because they're they're providing so many services at different at different points along the chain that one service they can provide later on could could sort of affect one of their earlier services and, and vice versa to dance point, which I think is a really smart point. I'm sure they're thinking about that. And I'm sure, you know, they can also change the prices and bring them down over time if they need to, you know, whether that's on the grading price or the fee, the free the fee structure, depending on where they want everything to be at. Um, there's all sorts of things, you know, how many employees do they want? Which employees? Maybe they, maybe they're cheaper employees to hire in this area. So they want to grow that area. You know, maybe there's, they think that there's more room to grow in this area. You know, I, I would, I would assume that they know what they're doing and that they have a plan and this will probably work out well. Um, you know, and in the in the short to medium term, it it it, it certainly is a is a hit on a percentage basis to my business. Um, but and I, I'm I don't know if I'm going to be using the eBay Vault or how much I'm going to be using the eBay Vault. These are things that we're just going to have to see as 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 time goes on. Um, but um, yeah, as far as your question about like other grading card companies, I forget exactly what it was, PK. But just what are how is this going to impact other grading card companies or? Yeah, I mean, how does other grading card companies compete? I mean, it's already been tough to compete with PSA right now because one of the reasons they were able to compete was the obvious, like PSA's turnaround times for two years. That's why they were able to compete. Anybody that was less than two years became a viable option. But now with PSA's turnaround times low, their cards sell for a premium. With this new eBay vault, you know, streamlined process rolling out i just i feel like it's going to be very tough for these companies to really be able to compete and definitely not at the levels they were i don't know the internal workings you know i i from a from a sort of just outsider like in instinct perspective which i would take with a grain of salt i you know i i would agree with that general take and just say that PSA seems to have been killing for a long time and they're just seem to be monopolizing and buying more and more things. And most of what they do just continues to be successful. And they, I think that they just probably are just going to continue to take larger market share as time goes on. What is interesting is there's like all sorts of grading card companies still opening up like smaller ones, you know, like put BGS and CGC and some of these, you know, larger, you know, the, the you know, the, the major competitors of, of, if we want to call them a PSA, um, even though they're, they're, they're quite far behind at this point. Um, 
you know, in, in the, in these areas, specifically with like TCGs and Pokemon. Um, but yeah, we'll, uh, you know, all these new grading card companies trying to, there, there are grading card companies coming out now that are trying, that are focusing more on innovating around the slab and around the process and making it more of like a, maybe more aesthetically pleasing, maybe higher end material and they're charging more money. I'm interested to see, I almost feel like there's maybe more opportunity in something like that where PSA, PSA is going to be that sort of like, you know, um, gold standard in terms of people respecting the grade, maybe specifically the grade, but, but as far as like wanting something that's very attractive or specific colors or, or something that's more durable, people are even trying to, some of these companies are trying to bring in technology, um, not not just in terms of the grading side and the AI side, but even in the slab itself. Like it, it'll have like it'll it'll store like the ownership and who owned it in the past, or you can put videos on it. Like I've I've talked to people who are doing all and trying all sorts of ideas and things. So like a blockchain type that, technology uh, in the slab, you're saying? Sorry, like, like a blockchain technology in the slab where you I can don't see ownership of it. I don't think it's on the blockchain, but like okay. that would be something theoretically I, I I suppose could be. But um yeah, it's um it's interesting. Uh um I think there'll there'll certainly be a lot more innovation, you know, but but why would PSA may end up buying, you know, uh the best, you know, version of that and then having a higher end you know, slab product under a different name that they own that, you know, different options for different people, different types of things. This is the thing about brands and the thing about having money is that the big brand and the big money often wins because they can, they can make, they can buy the, buy out those smaller ideas. Uh, um, and, um, you know, we'll, uh, we shall see. We shall see. Um, but it's well, it's looking more and more likely that yeah, PSA is uh, gonna yeah continue to do do very well and dominate dominate the grading space. Well, it's sort of like their acquisition of SGC. I feel like it was kind of one of those weird acquisitions that nobody kind of saw coming, and maybe didn't really make sense. At least from the Pokemon side, it doesn't make sense. But I one of the arguments I heard people talking about like the SGC um, acquisition was that PSA was already like communicating with SGC when it came to like a lot of vintage sports cards, because that's really where SGC has cemented himself as being like, I just don't know enough about that vintage card markets or vintage sports cards. So I guess vintage sports, and you could tell me if I'm wrong, Jake is like anything pre 1960s. And that's something like SGC is like really well respected in. And I guess that PSA and SGC had been doing a lot of collabs and Nat Turner pretty much came out and said it just made sense for them to acquire them. But if they could acquire SGC, it's like, well, who else can they acquire? Can they acquire Beckett? Because if you acquire Beckett, one of the big questions that always looms on over PSA's head and one of the questions that Nat you know, talked about on my channel when I had him on mm -hmm. was you know, that black label type you know, like the, the better 10. Mm -hmm. And if you acquire a company like Beckett, you solve that problem for you. It's like, well, well SGC has that too. They have they? a, they have a premier, they have two tens. Yeah. Okay. I never seen the other one, like the other. Premier it's one. very hard to get the other one. Yeah. It's okay. a different mm -hmm. color is the way you'd be able to notice it. Yeah. Gotcha. When I heard of that happening, that was my first thought that PSA was like, cause I think the worst business decision ever would be like PSA adding a premium 10 because they've already certified tens of million. Like Terrible. they would infuriate yeah. so many people. Like, what are you telling me? My, my 10 out of 10 is no longer perfect. Like, like the best grade I can ever get. So when PSA bought SGC, my thought was that they were um going to chase that subsection of the market, which is a much smaller market, but like they're buying, I think SGC is like 7% of the market or maybe, maybe two. I don't even know what percentage it is part of like gem rate. But yeah, like they're chasing CGC, they're chasing BGS for that premier 10, and then they're not doing damage. Like they're not cannibalizing their own business otherwise.
<clears throat> Any thoughts on the SGC acquisition, Jake? Or not really. When when did that happen? I'm forgetting now. About a month ago. Yeah, just oh, I thought it was recently. Longer. Maybe a few months. Maybe yeah. a few. Yeah, I remember hearing about rumblings of that for a while in sort of the sports and Star Wars groups that I'm in. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a. Uh, um, I think SGC generally is quite well liked uh, for most people I talk to who who use it and are interested in it. It's definitely a love hate like the the look of the slab, you know, the aesthetic of it. But as far as experiences with the company, um, you know, I, I don't know. You know, it, it's 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 interesting. The, the sort of uh, the idea of like how rare should PSA 10s be is what we're really talking about because it doesn't matter. PSA 10 is the same. Like it's we're talking about something. It's like uh one in a thousand cards, one in 500 cards, you know, it's, it, it gets so ridiculous at the top. Like, and the higher you go, the more silly it gets when you see these black labels and you're like, all right, fine, yeah. whatever. What's the difference between a black label? You know, it just gets more and more, all of it's silly. Like we all know that all of it is silly to some degree, but it's really fun. And it also makes a lot of sense because we all like chasing things and we want the rarest and we want the best. We want to be given these types of things, but it's like, how far can you push that before people are just like, I'm out, <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, these companies are toying, toying with that. And, you know, you're going to have your like black label, but then what is, what if there's like a, what a, a particularly good black label with even like better eye appeal, like you have like a diamond rating around them. It's like getting another company to rate your PSA 10. Yeah. Will that end up happening? I don't know. And it's, that's, that's one thing with like tag. I don't know if you guys are familiar with with technology assisted grading or whatever it, whatever it stands for. They actually they rate the cards out of like a thousand. You have to pay double. Yeah, the it's main like $30 issue dollars the card though. It's yeah, kind of crazy. The, the, the main issue with that is most people like PSA because they have a ten out of ten perfect card. There's no higher grade. Their card is perfect the way that they see it. Um, why are you gonna spend double the money? to have someone demean your card and bully your card and tell you everything wrong with it. It's like, I don't want to spend double the money for you to tell me that microscopically this atom is out of place on, on the back left bottom quadrant. Um, I, I People don't want that. They want perfect 10 out of 10 cards. Um, I say that mostly jokingly, but mostly seriously too somehow. Um, but what they do is... If they grade out of a thousand point scale, like theoretically, say a thousand Moonbrions get graded with tag in the next five years, you will know where you rank out of the 1000 Moonbrions. So like with PSA, if you buy a PSA 10 Moonbrion, if you buy a black label Moonbrion, you might be one of 12,000 PSA 10s. You might be one of 500. I don't, I don't know how many black labels there are. If you buy with tag though, you will know that you are first out of 500 Moonbrions. And then the day that yours becomes second because someone beat it, you will know that like it, it, it's crazy in a lot of ways. I think it's crazy to a level that people don't want because they just want perfection for cheap relative. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, I, mean, right. I don't think people want that sort of like scrutiny over their cards, which might be the death of a company like tag and uh, ZNG sold that tag eight and it sold less than a PSA eight. And it's like, you got all this extra scrutiny and it still sells for less. Like I can tell you as a collector, what I like, you know, and that's, you know, and everyone's going to like different things. And we also don't know how much our, what we like is obviously just sort of a, we're just copying sort of other people, you know, there's this consensus and we just want things that are valuable and other people think are valuable and are going to recognize as valuable, right? We teasing all of that apart is, uh, is, is uh, uh, not going to, you're not going to be able to do that. Um, that's the psychology of, of value and of markets where we take things that have no, you know, physiological value as far as like nourishing our, us or giving us shelter or something and we have feelings about them and we we like them and we we are willing to pay money for them right so anyway so it's it's uh but for me just as a collector i like psa 10s often but i like psa 10s when i look at them that i don't see anything obviously wrong by the naked eye 
but you know, and maybe like little tiny bit of whitening, but the centering looks good by the naked eye. The, the, there's no scratching by the naked eye and the back looks generally good. And I enjoy it. I enjoy having some of my favorite cards that look like that, that are in slabs that are protected, that are sort of perfect. It's, it's fun and enjoyable. I, I, I don't know how much of a premium that's worth to me. You know, in many cases it's not, I have a lot of nines because the tens are so, you know, have such a, such a huge percentage. Um, but there are cards where the nines and the tens, there isn't that, that much of a difference. And the tens actually very hard to grade. It's very hard to find cards that are that perfect. And it's enjoyable to get something a little bit rare for a couple hundred extra dollars or a thousand extra dollars if I can afford it. And, uh, it's fun. Um, you know, how many people are in my boat, how many people are just investing, you know, because they want to make money or speculating, are they really valuing it at, you know, these are the conversations we've been having, having forever that, that is very personal. No one knows the answer, but certainly all, all of those things are true for different people. But, um, but I think the, um, you know, it's strange. It's, it, it, it was, it's always been strange to me, people who tell people what they should like, and what they should like to collect and that no like you're collecting the wrong way if you find value in the black label or you find value in this you're stupid the smart people find more value in the nines or the smart people find more value in completely ungraded only true collectors love it's all arbitrary yeah. it's like are you curing yourself <laughs> like it's all arbitrary you're collecting Pokemon cards and TCG stuff. Like your collecting habits are no more valid than my collecting habits, right? But when we, when we, um, and and hopefully we're not addicted to any of this and we're not putting it over, like, you know, I'm, I'm a little feet, addicted right? to it. I, I'm not gonna <laughs> right, lie. but you know, but but that you know, that's a more important discussion than sort of telling people what they should let. You know, that's the part that always annoys me. But as far as like what will hold value, what seems overvalued. You know, these discussions are, are always interesting. I'm not sure, you know, how, uh, how much they've amounted to over, over time, but. <laughs> well, let me ask you a question, Jake, and just kind of talking in the more general term of just undervalued, overvalued you. I know you're very into just the collectible market, whether it's Pokemon and obviously mainly trading cards you specialize in, but you, you look at a lot of different stuff and, just today, Reserved Investments put out a video talking about the comic book market, how we're seeing some pretty high realized prices just for comic books. But it seems like just the collectible hobbies as a whole, and it doesn't really matter what you're into, whether it's currencies or what. It looks like we're in another mini collectibles boom. What What do you think is like one of the factors of that? Because one of the arguments you would have made was, well, collectibles went through all this you know, big hype because you could say, yeah, the pandemic, but also like interest rates were really low. And now we're supposed to be people have less spending power, interest rates are higher, but we're sort of seeing like a mini boom happen, not just in Pokemon, but <clears throat> shout out to Professor Oak, but Bless in a lot of different <laughs> hobbies. So what do you think is like a factor for that? I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, S and P five hundred is high. Crypto's high. Like the, right, the way why. that the that the question is yeah. why you know, and and I can I can sit here and I can give you some, economists will give you twenty different answers. Yeah, like, some yeah. <laughs> macro reasons. I think the inflation data today was really interesting. It'll be interesting to see if that impacts markets, if the consumer sentiment, because you have the psych the psychology of all of it, and then you have sort of the math and the underlying health and these things are, are, you know, are, um, um, but I, I don't, I don't know if I have anything too smart to sound it. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's, a. um, what about from a sentiment standpoint, are you seeing sentiment changes in these hobbies though? Forget, forget dollar amount because you, we all know, and you guys, are super engaged in Pokemon, you you see sentiment changes. And if for anybody out there doesn't know, uh, both Dan and Jake, they have the Pokenomics Discord. If you guys are looking for more in-depth breakdowns, both of them do office hours every week. You could ask these guys questions one-on-one. -on -one. The same way that I'm on this live, you could be on a live, a private live. You could ask these guys questions. And I recommend you guys join in their Discord. It's probably going to be super valuable for a lot of people out there watching. So, 
Back to the sentiment question, though. Do you feel sentiment changes, at least? Either one of you guys. I, I, I personally, so for those who don't know, I'm I'm full time to poke into in Pokemon and, and cards in general. And so, you know, I spend a lot of my time at, at shows, talking to customers, talking to consumers and, you know, in our in our Patreon and as well when we go on like I did a live probably a month ago talking about what I was you know on 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 the uh, the Pokenomics channel um, and I don't I, I what I said then and what I said in the re in in our recent Patreon is just that I, I'm meeting new people all the time getting into the hobby still uh, people who are just like enthusiastically collecting like love talking Pokemon. I love collecting it as much as I ever have right now. Uh, starting this business has not affected my love or enjoyment of collecting. And I've been actually able to collect more. I'm having fun doing it. For me, it's like if I have free money, one of my favorite places to spend sort of my excess money is on these types of things because I because I really enjoy it. I think there's a lot of people, you know, who are like me um who who are still here and still really enjoying collecting and are um you know maybe dabbling in business or 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 selling and flipping but but are still enjoying it and then you have new adults and new kids and it seems it seems fairly consistent and strong i'm never going to understand I, you know the fact that pokey rev makes a video on umbreon I heard about that the, and, mm -hmm. and that card, you know, these things, this just shows you how sensitive and easy these markets can, can completely shift and how things can are so psychological and emotional. Um, and, but that should teach you a lesson that the opposite can happen too. Mm -hmm. So, so I think as long as people are understanding like what, what's going on here and, and, ha and how to, be careful at navigating sort of those, those ups and downs and sort of the craziness of, of, of the way people can just change their shift opinions or, and so much of the hobby is just built on comps, right? Just be, Oh, this is what it's selling for now. So this is what it is. Right. And, 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 you know, and how easy it is to, uh, and I'm not using the word manipulate in a negative way necessarily, but just manipulate a market by doing like a buyout of a certain card and pushing the price up. And then people start talking, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Right. These are just hopefully examples of like, of how susceptible in the short run. Now, in the long run, what does it mean? What do these things mean? And how many cards can that happen to and can it keep continuing happening? And then can it happen the other way? You know, we saw during the, during the burst, right? The, the, you know, oh, the hobby is going to die. No one's going to be here anymore, right? That's the sort of fear and anxiety. Wasn't that long ago that like, Booster boxes were selling for 60 bucks, like 65, 70 bucks. Battle styles, you know, chilling rain, 72 to 85, right? That sort of negative sentiment. These things like just take the take the crazy ups with the crazy downs. I just hope that people stay gen generally interested. And I think that, that that's what I'm always looking for. Are people generally genuinely interested in having fun doing this? No matter what no matter if they're just collecting or have a business in it. And if this is enjoyable, it'll, it'll have value because that's the value. The value is the joy. If the value becomes all of the stonking and just trying to make money. And once that disappears, there's no joy or interest in any of this to you. That's a problem for the market and the, and the long-term market health. So I think generally, like every time I have conversations with people who are just like excited to be here and doing this and are enjoying it, like it's just more people that, are having fun and attracting their friends and bringing their friends in it. And all of that too makes things more and more socially acceptable. I made a video a long time ago on my channel about is Pokemon cool? Can Pokemon be cool again? Right. Can Pokemon be cool for adults? Like these are like, these are those to me are that to me is like the really important thing. Is it socially acceptable? Is it fun? Can people collect this with their kids? Those type of consumer sentiments are what's going to drive the market, not in the long run, 
not like which hot card or which hot set is stonking today because of some manipulation or buyouts or craziness or 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 someone trying to make a bunch of money or a bunch of people trying to make a bunch of money or a content creator saying something you know um and the, and those things unless you're doing a pump and dump actively and, and involved in that timing something like that and knowing when it's going to happen and what is is a is a fool's is a fool's game i would say Dan, what about you? Uh, I know Jake mentioned a little bit, but in your uh, Discord, are you seeing new people join? Because I know you got a weird dichotomy going on now in your, in especially your Discord. I would take a guess that you have people that have been around the hobby for a few years now. You got a lot of people have built businesses in the last couple of years, but are you still seeing an influx of new people join in or not really? Yeah, we, I mean, we have ebbs and flows. We, we, um, we shout it out a bit more directly and then we get a, a fresh batch in to some extent and some people take an exit for a while. Some come back, some don't, but it, uh, I mean, Jake, Jake sees more of those back end numbers. I, I'm more like the back end of the discord. He's more the back end of the Patreon. We're relatively close to where we've been like at the peak, right? Like relatively. Um, so but kind of sharing Jake's same sentiment as far as being at conventions and being in Discord and, and occasionally browsing Facebook, it seems like generally speaking, a lot of people are having a pretty good time. Obviously, if you get into little bubbles, if you get way deep down the rabbit hole, you can find some unhealthy things. On, on Reddit, you can find some unhealthy things. On YouTube, like way too much optimism, way too much pessimism even too. Um, you, you can find both extremes always, as with anything on the internet. But generally speaking, like like taking a, a step back, I mean, looking a couple years of printing more than 9 billion cards, hopefully the next month or two, we'll get the numbers from Pokemon Corporate again. I think usually in June, they give us what they printed for the prior fiscal year. So we should be getting that soon. I mean, in spite of everything that's gone on, the pop from the, the pandemic bubble, maybe the shifting of the bubble to the other parts and... Everything is like going way better than I would have expected. If you told me two and a half years ago when I quit my job, I expected things to get pretty dark relative to where they were. They are so much better, like liquidity wise. Like a lot of the prices are down, but the liquidity is just unbelievable. And how much of that is collectors, investors, what, what amount should it be of each? And I don't know the answers to any of those things, but overall, like I just feel good. I feel good about everything that I'm seeing for the um like like the broad the, the broad part of that individual things i could nitpick i could say this or that i'm not too happy about the whole ebay vault thing today but like generally speaking i'm pretty happy about everything <laughs> well i i think we're very lucky you know like like which is i think behind the sentiment that dan was saying there a bit is just you know and i think i think that this was not a sure thing we both Dan and I had our and continue to have our <laughs> in our opinions and others might disagree <laughs> sort of a, objective kind of pragmatic concerns and anxieties about <laughs> about all of this but like we're both pleased generally and you know we 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 both took risks to a certain extent now we are both pretty cautious and conservative and we took those risks with uh you know certain safeguards and certain, you know, if this doesn't work out. And and I, I think I speak for both of us, Dan, that we still have that attitude about this, which is that it's not, none of this is guaranteed from a business perspective, even just from a collector perspective that like other people will still be enjoying it and we'll be able to do it with other people. So it, it feels really fun. It's feel very lucky to be enjoying it, both having a business in it and collecting. And yeah, it's, it's like a great, great way to spend your time. <laughs> I, I mean, I enjoy mm. <laughs> use the word risk right there jake do you think now is a time i feel like there was a lot of times in the hobby where if you took big risks they really really paid off for you true sure. and i don't feel like in the you never know in the moment that those risks are going to pay off otherwise they wouldn't be called risks right they'd be called just like something else but do you feel right now is still a time that you should be taking risks Well, there's a lot of things you could take risks on right now that I think have the benefit that, and like, it, I think it's a good question. It's, it's never, it won't be an easy answer, but 
is it so, okay to still take risks? So I, I think of, of investing or, or trying to make money. What you're doing is you're taking calculated risks that are calculated in your favor. And so everything has a percentage of failure, pretty much everything, let's say. So everything has risk if we want to even, – even like amazingly smart investments may still have some percentage risk, 5, 10, 15, 20 percent, whether you're investing – you know, in whatever, whatever type of asset. So, you know, you're not, you're not trying to, you're not, you're not trying to avoid risk completely necessarily. You're trying to minimize as much risk as possible on the downside. Right. Um, but it's all about risk reward and it's all, and it's all math. So it's really like, well, if theoretically let's, let's take a coin flip, right? Well, if I'm, if I'm, every time I win a coin flip, I'm making, I, I, you know, 50, uh, 50, one percent, right? You know, or whatever. Um, I, I'm sorry. I'm making. Let's say when I when I flip a coin and I get a heads, I get a uh, hundred and one dollars. And when I flip a coin and I get a tails, you know, I lose a hundred a hundred dollars. That's a good bet. Like over time, you would take that. You would take. You would make a dollar for every hundred flips, theoretically, over time in a long run. Now. Of course, like investing isn't so clear and there's a million different things to buy and do and timing things is really hard. So it's not, it's not, it's not as obvious like what you should do or what anyone should do. So if you're asking me like in this moment in the market, like should you be doing what exactly? I mean, there's a million choices and a million things and, and it's also about what price you're buying stuff at and where, you know, and are, you know, and, and and what your plan is with it. And then it also has to do with your current financial situation. So what percentage of your own finances are you putting in? Then it also has to do with like quality of life and mental health. And, you know, this is why Dan and I can be really annoying to listen to, understandably. We don't say that. You got to get that nuance. Yeah. <laughs> because, because it's sort of like, well, I can give you my answer for myself in depth if I wanted to share, you know, exactly what I'm doing and why I'm doing. I, I, I think I know what I'm doing and I'm doing, I'm very intentional about what I'm doing every day and what I'm buying. Every deal I make is very intentional. How long I'm holding things, what I'm selling, what I'm pushing. Right. But all of that is very personal to my, my estimates. Now, do I think that there are people should be investing their money, just simply putting money into, into anything Pokemon putting it away and holding it as their primary means of becoming wealthy. I do not. And I have not for a while, for a long time. So like, and, uh, Oh, go, go ahead. If you're, well, yeah, I mean, but that, <laughs> but like our, but like flipping things and reselling, you can certainly become very wealthy if you're good at that. And, and buying things and holding some things Particularly if you're being if you're savvy about it and you're like, well, listen, the last bunch of Japanese sets, like specialty sets, all went to like two hundred to five hundred dollars, and I can buy this one at uh, in in mass at forty dollars. You know, I'm just giving an example, like tr you know, um, uh, um, what's it called? Treasure. Uh, what's the set? No, I'm blanking on the name. Shiny treasure. Shiny treasure. Yeah, yeah. Shiny treasure, um, just for example, right? Oh, well, the last time a box went down to 40 after a big reprint, now that box is up to 160. Maybe the same thing will happen here. Maybe, and I like holding Pokemon and I have excess money and it's fun to kind of like speculate a little bit on this. So I'm going to buy a bunch of that and then keep it sealed and store it away and like hope it goes to 160 and then sell it then. There's nothing about that that's stupid. Like, like I would never criticize, like, totally reasonable like and you're having fun now if you're doing that instead of like if it's done on 30 percent credit with your rent yeah, money yeah or you're doing <laughs> that and you have no traditional investments at all and you're like in your 30s or late 30s i wouldn't be doing that i wouldn't take that type of risk personally i would be maybe you do some of that but then you also do some more traditional investments i mean there are ways to do it that that would be reasonable that i would think might be reasonable um, but yeah, that, 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 that's my, my honest answer, but you're going to get the most out of your money, in my opinion, by flipping and reselling and being active, but that takes time. That takes energy. It takes skill and, you know, all, all, all sorts of things. It's not for everyone. And I actually was listening to some finance content relatively recently. I genuinely don't, I was down some rabbit hole. I don't even remember what channel it was or whatever, 
but that the, there was the, this is kind of switching it because PK was showing a coin, but like theoretically, obviously, if I flip coin 50, fair coin 50 50 heads tails, if I offer you the opportunity to play, if you win, it's plus 100, if you lose, it's minus 100. We can play a million times and you're going to come out relatively even, P plus or minus a little bit, doesn't make any difference. Vegas succeeds because it's not that, right? It, it's it's plus 100, but it's minus 102 when you lose or or whatever. They they shift the odds slightly. If you in your life were given the opportunity to flip a coin, but you can only play one time and the buy-in's $50,000. For a multimillionaire, that makes sense to do. Like they're going to you're going to get 100 grand if it hits your call and you lose 50 grand only if it misses your call. That's plus EV, like by nature, by its design, it's it's plus EV. You should take it. But if you losing that play, if you taking that risk on the, on the, even though it's plus EV, there can be a high likelihood that you could lose money and wipe out risk. Like, like one thing Warren Buffett will always say is like, avoid wipe out risk. You cannot, and depending on your situation, depending like very, very different answer for different people, whether or not you should take a coin flip for to win a hundred grand to only lose 50 grand. Well, if you've only got 50 grand to your name, you probably should lean towards not doing it. If you've got a million dollars to your name, like, yeah, that's that's very plus EV. That's very smart to do like you do that. But different answers for different people. Same game, different, same game, same rules, but, but different situations lead to different outcomes. And one thing I constantly say, we're in the same arena. We're all in Pokemon. But not only do we not, like, we, we might be playing different games. And then on top of that, we might have different rules entirely. Like we all have very different opportunity costs. Some people, they, they don't know where they're going to scrounge together the $800 for rent on the first. They don't know how they're going to pay that $2,500 credit card bill. And I mean, this is all stuff I've said a million times. And Is there anything in the <laughs> world that is comparable to Pokemon? Like what the way we interact with Pokemon, is there anything like Pokemon? I mean, there's a lot of TCGs that are like it, but like, not a, like di no, different no, like, levels of like it, no, right? Like anything, like the way we interact in this market with like speculating, you know, buying, selling, flipping. Is there anything like it? I mean, I guess, I don't know. I can't think anything. Like I would say even like sports, you can make the argument, but sports is so different with the way the products are built, you know? It's all about that one of one chase, all about that one of five chase. Pokemon is just so inherently different than so many other things, though. I can't really compare it to anything. It depends, yeah. It depends what we're what we're talking about exactly. Like, you know, all markets have similar psychologies and points to the, to what Dan and I are talking about. But yeah, specifics like what what are the specific things in Pokemon? that like specific patterns in Pokemon that are Pokemon specific versus coins, stamps, books, comic books, you know, or, or other TCGs and cards. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> Signs. Exactly. You know, Legos, whatever, whatever, you know, it's, it's, some are going to be more similar in terms of the patterns that you see and some are going to be less similar. And then you can figure out sort of why, you know, one thing that's always interesting, like over time, right? It's like, well, what what becomes expensive in this hobby versus that hobby? Is it the same type of thing that's the most expensive thing in comic books, in sports, in coins that is the most expensive thing in Pokemon, or is it going to be different? And when I say the same type of thing, I mean, you know, the first of something or whatever, the rarest or, you know, any sort of objective, uh, we could say intrinsic properties of, of the thing, you know, what are we going to value? What is the collector community going to value and think is the best in Pokemon versus the best in something else is going to, you know, there's going to be some differences and some similarities and, and no one knows how much of that is just sort of we're going to follow the same patterns as all these other hobbies, or if we're going to follow, if we're going to have different patterns for a variety of different reasons, because Pokemon is different fundamentally, or it attracts a different type of person, or we have influencers and our, our culture shapers and our value shapers are different and, and are shaping different ideas and different things. Um, I think that's extremely powerful. I think that what people like the culture shapers and people telling people what to like and what's good 
and then people kind of supporting those people is are very very powerful forces that don't necessarily ever completely you know once that train is out of the tr you know on the track it 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 may have a life of its own and and stay valuable for for a very long time even if if there's no re there's no reason why it's valuable other than a few people decided that they were going to tell a bunch of people that it that it should be you know i don't i can't think of an example of that where it's like everyone hated this and then one influencer said it's amazing and you know but like theoretically that that could possibly happen to some degree and, and you you've got to be a big dan fan to have made it through like two weeks ago i made a video about my stein convention that i went to it's i mean I'm I'm very bullish on Pokemon because like my wife is a teacher. She teaches third graders. I have a bunch of young, like uh children of my friends and children of family, like cousins and stuff. A lot of people are into Pokemon. When you go to a convention for this stuff, I'm the youngest person there by like half almost. Um it, it is literally a dying hobby. But like vintage versus modern, they've got like new serialized steins versus the old stuff. They've got some 80-year-old, 90-year-old, like like old advertising. They've got old uh all beer trays and beer coasters and it's really cool to see all the dynamics in a different market like that in, in a in a lot of ways utica club shelton dooley steins are worlds apart universe like just completely different but in a lot of ways they're very very similar to the pokemon market too how many people showed up to that event i never <clears throat> i think there were 25 to 30 vendors and there were probably like probably a little over 100 people in total like in and out of the building That's overall shocking to me see like, high or low <laughs> that's wild <clears throat> that there was 100 people that even knew that existed that's and the weather the weather was really really bad it, it was actually a really bad storm that day um i've been to much bigger ones like i think if the weather was nicer it would have been a fair bit bigger this was also done like 15 minutes from the brewery like it's a very popular local brewery the 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 print run on a lot of the newer steins are in the three to five hundred territory, and they sell out. They sell out quickly usually. Um, so there's a thousand ish collectors maybe. Like I mean, at various stages, there's probably thousands, but there's probably like five hundred to a thousand like more hardcore collectors. I would say. Yeah, we uh, so last week it was the last weekend of the weekend before I went to uh. Mm -hmm like an outlet store and they had a a convention there. So I brought the wife, I brought the kids and they went and like went to all the outlets while I went to the convention. And it's so different going to something like that versus a Collecticon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the people that are over there, I was just listening to some of the people talk. They were flipping through binders and they're like, oh, I like these cards, but I really like the packs that guy has over there because he made them himself. They were talking about mystery packs saying and like talking to their friends and agreeing and i just kind of like looking around just like we are so disconnected from most people yeah. and then i went to another table and something that i've never really seen at collecticon somebody was selling a bunch of fake cards and i said to him i was like uh it was like a little kid he must have been like 11 or 12 and i said to him i said do you know that a lot of these cards are fake and the kid's like, there's no fake cards here. And then, like, I pointed to one of the Poncho Pikachus. It was, like, one of the clearly fake ones. And then he looked at his dad. He's like, oh, well, those are, uh, what do you call them, dad? And he's like, fan appreciation arts. And I'm like, kid, you know these cards are fake. And I just kind of walked away. I didn't even, like, know what to do. It was so out of my element, you know? Like, I don't know. felt super weird. I... I I don't really know where I was going with that. It's just something I want to share. Cause... I mean, I not so much the 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 proxy cards or whatever, but the first part. I I enjoy being around collectors of all sorts who are interested. Like when someone lights up around getting a mystery pack because it's fun. That's great. Like this is the whole weird thing about people telling people what to collect or what they should like. Now, if you're telling someone to invest. This was always my thing on my channel. If you were yeah. telling a person invest in mystery packs or open up a bunch, it's like, no, 
right? But if you get a kick out of like what might be in there and, but, you know, clearly the person who's putting together the mystery packs more than likely are the mystery products or whatever, more than likely is making a business decision, how they can move a lot of product or that maybe they don't want or get a little bit extra for it or whatever. There, there, there's, there's a reason. It's probably not the kindness of their heart that they're, that they're, they're making the mystery products, right? They're a business, but that doesn't mean that it's not a fun consumer product. And, and so when I hear people who enjoy anything in the hobby, I'm just glad people are having fun. Like I have fun doing, like there are certain things that, that I really enjoy doing that's just consuming. I'm not thinking about finance, you know, and in, in this hobby and, and elsewhere when I just like, I love going out to eat sometimes and like going out to the movie. It's like just pure consumer. Like those are businesses. They're not doing that as a charity. Like this, this restaurant for me to spend the money, right? Like they're making some percentage, they're making some money. So it's very odd, the sort of, but this is, this is where the conversation I think broke down was that you had certain people who were very upset and, and rightfully so in my view at people who were taking advantage of others and selling them these types of products under the guise of investment or or this is going to make you wealthy or whatever that that's where the hobby gets into this this sort of uh, predatory you know that that's when it becomes predatory but as long as you're not doing any of that stuff i think people who are telling people what to collect and enjoy it's sort of like mind your own business like i I, I definitely wasn't there i wasn't i wasn't telling anybody what no not you no 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 (laughs) i did tell the people they were selling fake cards though kind of like the whole fake card thing that's the fake card thing can be a little harder because you don't want people can get that could be predatory in and of itself right you know someone could buy that thinking it's real or someone could sell it to someone and then they use it to scan like that and it's there's bit- shades of there's shades of gray there too because it's like yeah. if they're selling proxies or fakes as fakes it's like it's better than selling them as real but it's still illegal it's still copyright infringement it's still intellectual property all that stuff how much you care about that like but as with almost anything there's levels there's shades of gray like the worst case scenario is they're selling a fake as real trying to get the full premium trying to like really pull one over but the um the better way to do it is to sell it as a as a fan or a proxy whatever you want to call it and yep. replica. But they didn't call it that until I said to them. I po- I literally pointed at the card because I the first thing were I they said asking was, like a thousand dollars or were they asking like five bucks or something? Well, some of the they had like some of the, you know the really shitty gold ones that have like the gold pokeball on the oh. back. It was like the Pikachu from Crimson Invasion, like the one where he's standing on the beach. It was like that card, but in the gold card, like it yeah. had a five dollar price tag on it. Sure. So, yeah, it's yeah. like, I mean that that's clearly a fake. You're trying the, to those are at Collecticon though too. Like, like there are some there that's are some cool. entire tables that are like hundred dollar bills that are like gold with like Pikachu and stuff on it. And but but Dan, I said, do you know you're selling fake cards? And they said to me, no, all these cards are real. And then I pointed to them and then they went and were like, oh, those are fan. Well, fan well they're not fake. Art. They're fan arts. It's, yeah, I mean, so, semantics. <laughs> but I don't know. I didn't even know how to handle it. I just kind of walked away. I was just like, uh, I got to pick my battles. I'm not going to pick a fight with a 12 year old selling cards <laughs> yeah. at some Pokemon convention, you know, so. Yeah, my thing is just the separation of sort of like and and the way these like these two conversations. And again, this is not this was not in response to what you were saying at all, PK. It's just it's just sort of where my mind went, you know, talking about these ideas is is just this like weird sort of like we you need to just make money and focus on like being smart and making money it's like you absolutely don't have to try to make money like you can just like pokemon and enjoy the hobby like or and and then people who are trying to do a business or trying to you know you know have an expensive like those people are playing their own game and they're having fun and i guess i just it's just nice that there's a bunch of people here enjoying the hobby in all different ways and who who's to say that there's a right way it's sort of like uh you know if you really enjoy if i really enjoy trophy cards oh i'm a sophisticated collector who really knows what they're doing but someone who gets excited at a mystery pack is an idiot it's like are you kidding me 
we're yeah. all idiots. Like yeah. we're all, you know, we're all silly. Like this is not so serious. Have fun, enjoy whatever you enjoy and like be nice to people and be happy that we even just like have free time to hang out on the hobby, I guess is my, uh, my rant on this stuff. And I, I, I get so sick of just like, uh, uh, the weirdness, you know, of, 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 uh, um, that sort of like money mis mis and then I think so much of the negativity on sort of the money talk comes from the sort of like weird, like, like you need to care. And I do run into this sometimes, like now that I'm like a full-time business in this, like once in a while, I'll run into someone on like Verbank or a Facebook group or something who like will not, not sell to businesses because they think we're like the scum of the earth. And like the fact that I would dare to offer below 100% on a card and that I would talk about percentages, like it ruins the hobby for every, you know, it's like you have these extreme takes on that side. And then you have these extreme takes on like people who aren't financially, who are wasting their money on mystery pet or like something else or like stupid. And it's just like, are you there are some super weird takes out there. I, I made that video recently or, or my live stream, wherever I talked about how I'm paying like 80 to 95% on certain products. And there was a person in my comments that was like, I'm unsubbing. I didn't know where you were going with this the whole video. But then at the end, you, you I see that you're just milking your audience. To, it's like I made an offer to buy their stuff at or above what they might yield, like selling it themselves. No risk. It's like, what are we even talking? Like, some people are just so weird. So well, weird. <laughs> and kind of talk about what Jake said is the reason I've at this point curated my channel to talk about certain things. And the same way, Dan, you said you were going to kind of just stop giving, like, your blanket, uh, like, warnings in every video. Trying to know? do less. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I'm already and failing. it's the same thing, like, when I've curated my channel, like, the viewers watching this, like, I can talk about things the way I talk about it because I believe that my viewer base is a very certain type of collector in this hobby. They're not the average collector. So I don't I don't worry anymore about talking about money. And that's why I'm fine with focusing on that stuff more because I believe that the people that are listening to this understand where I'm coming from. And it's the same way that Dan is hopefully like not gonna give a warning in every video like <laughs> don't go broke on Pokemon. <laughs> warning i i did it just in this video so i'm not doing well yeah <laughs> like I, I that's why i've just curated my channel to just talk to a certain type of person so i feel and it might come off as like more money focused or whatever but it's because i've curated that sort of viewership and i it's not made for the little kid that was selling proxy cards who i it's just not made for him you know sure well, I don't think there's that much to talk about. Like, I mean, first of all, it's hard to talk endlessly even about the money part, but at least that part's a little bit more complicated to to talk about and think about. If you're just sort of like, should I buy mystery packs? <laughs> like, let's, <laughs> let's do an analysis. It's like, well, will it be fun? And you know, sure. but see, this is the thing, Jake. If I yeah. did make a short 10 minute video, are mystery packs good buys? Like that's all I would have to title it. That video will get 10,000 views. Maybe. And then I would have people I, in I the did comment one... section tell me why they like to buy the Walmart <laughs> mystery packs. And then other people will be talking about the PokeRev packs. And other people will be talking about the PokeVault packs and the Danny Phantom packs, why those are good values. And then people will be talking about mystery power cubes, how th that will be the video to get 10,000 views. Because that's the what a lot of people want to hear because that's like the average collector. I, I made a video about mystery packs and my thoughts on the morality and the value and this and that. And sadly it did not get 10,000 views. Get 10, views. I got a couple thousand maybe. <laughs> but I, there's a couple videos. Like I feel like I could just throw out right now. Speaking of which I have to really make this video for freaking James's ink cards. <laughs> I, I forgot about that. It's been a while. That was my video for today. Uh, but uh do you are you familiar with these jake you remember how uh james from zng he graded a bunch of cards and they all came back with the green label inked james um, oh. i want to say he, yes i think he I made a couple shorts about it 
Yeah, I think I, I think I saw a short at some point. Yeah. So I reached out to James because uh, I saw this 5.5 Raichu in his submission. So I reached out to James like, hey, can you send me that 5.5 Raichu? Because what's an inked 5.5 unlimited Raichu between friends? It's nothing, right? And then James sends me this stack and like... There's one of the cards he sent me, Jake. <laughs> like he sent me some absolute bangers. So now I have to like really do a well edited, well done video. And I'm just so lazy I haven't got around to it yet. <laughs> there's it's a very nice gift. It was a very nice there's some bangers in here though. Awesome. So I I want to make sure that when I make the video I do it justice. So I've just been kind of dragging my feet on <laughs> I don't want to do it wrong. Oh. James is a good guy, good man. Yeah, James is one of the best. I'm really happy to see how James was able to grow his business the way he was able to, too, because he did it right. And I think uh, one of the best videos, and the sad thing is, is I'm going to say it's one of the best videos that has been put out in this hobby, but it won't get like a million views, but was James just talking about figuring out a show bidder and like, telling a show bidder you can't bid on my auctions that way and then removing all his items and stuff. And that was a really important video. And I really think it showed a lot about his character, you know? And the sad part is, is those videos will only get like, it'll get like whatever, 20,000 views, which is great for the space. But it's sad that those videos don't get the traction they should, you know? But I think you do videos like that, it speaks mountains for who you are as a person so i'm really happy i've supported james in the past and he's been super you know nice to me too so he's a good dude yeah so yes guys I, it uh... is 11 25 and unfortunately i have work tomorrow which sucks i have to be at work at 7 a.m so that means i'm up at 5 45 but uh jake buddy it's always great to see you and uh i think we might actually be up your way pretty soon so maybe we'll get together oh that'd be great that would be nice are you um are you gonna come to um charlotte and and uh new jersey this so year definitely definitely jersey and charlotte is a I I've like every week my wife is kind of like <laughs> working on okay. it. <laughs> yeah, we're working on it because she doesn't want me because they're so close to each other, like right in the smack dab of summer. So yeah, like two weeks apart, right? Yeah, and it's summer. That that's a big thing. Like summers when we do stuff as family, a lot of picnics and stuff, a lot of parties. But I'm yep. slowly working on it. So Jersey definite, and then yeah, I want to do Charlotte. If I do Charlotte, I'll just vend and maybe Jersey just for Saturday. We got four you? months, four months to put the work in. What about you, Jake? Are you gonna are you gonna be out of East <clears throat> Jersey or Charlotte? I'll be at, at those two, and I'm gonna go to card party, which I'm looking forward to. Okay. Be fun. Yeah, yeah. And then, so Dan, what, did you say your final? Uh, I know you said Jersey. You're gonna do like a little mini family vacation or something. Yeah, I'm actually doing a mini Disney trip with my wife, leading into Orlando Collecticon. So, I'm I'm doing like Sunday afternoon of. Orlando Collecticon. I'm doing part of I forget which day, Saturday or Sunday. I'm doing part for New Jersey. Neither neither vending. I was intending to pick up a bunch of eBay vault consignments, but I guess I'm not doing that anymore. Maybe or or maybe I am. I don't know. Uh, and then I'm doing Charlotte full vending. I'll, I'll be vending Charlotte. Sweet. And also um, Chicago. And this is just for everybody out there. I'm gonna say it one more time. If you guys are newer to the hobby or maybe you just want to hang out with like-minded people or be able to bounce questions off of people because this hobby is really, really tough to do by yourself. I think we could all agree that it helps to have like a support structure around you and support structure could just be like-minded people who are friends that understand this hobby. If you guys don't have those type of people, I do recommend you joining this, these two's discord and if uh, number one mod in the game, Drew, if you could do me a favor and drop a link to the Pokenomics Discord in the chat right now. I, and uh, after this live's over, I'll also link it down in the description below. I recommend you guys checking that out and uh, 
maybe just giving it a try for a month or two and seeing if you like it. Because I think it would definitely be valuable for a lot of people out there. And then the second thing is just the same way as Jake's going to be at Jersey, Dan's going to be at Jersey, I'm going to be at Jersey. I think Jersey's going to be the Collecticon this year. That's going to be a, a really good one. So if you're newer to this hobby and you don't know people, feel free to walk up to any three of us and ask us. First of all, the trade nights are public. But if you don't know where it is, we'll know where the trade night is. We'll tell you exactly where it is. Ask us what bar we go into and get in drinks at, you know, Saturday night. We'll tell you. Like, nothing's a secret. Everything's open. This hobby is very accepting, very welcoming. So if you guys are thinking about any Collecticon, I definitely recommend Jersey. But, uh, yeah, this hobby is, it's it's one thing to do it alone. It's another thing to do it with a great group of people and people that you could call friends. And I'm very grateful to be able to call both Dan and Jake my friends, so. With that said, everybody out there watching this, I know I could speak for myself. I can know I could speak for these two. We appreciate every single one of you. And as always, guys, we'll catch you on the next video.